Greetings. It, uh, I've been working on this for a few days now, and uh, I had it typed up on the computer, but in my travels, I forgot to grab my computer charger. For, so forgive me if I kind of stumble through this. My handwriting wasn't the cleanest as I was writing pretty quick. And uh, this is a uh, it's a sermon. I'm going to just call it what it is, and I think it's important that people hear it. Um, I think people need to comprehend why we're here and what our purpose truly is. And, um, you know, Mr. Anonymous uh, helped me out in a large part with this. Uh, he's a, a very spiritually enlightened man. And, um, you know, we had a, a three-hour conversation the other day, and the information that he was giving me was so poignant and important in the times that we're going through in this day and age that I felt the need to record our conversation, transcribe it so I could bring it back to you guys. And, um, you know, I know he doesn't really like me doing that a whole lot. Um, but at the same time, when I hear valuable, credible information that may help just one of you out there, it's worth my time to spend 8, 10, 12 hours transcribing something by hand. And then, of course, I turn around and I type it into a computer because, you know, if you don't do it yourself, it's not done right. Um, so forgive me if I make a mistake in this. And uh, if I do make a mistake, I'll come back and correct it at a later date. We have to be able to say who we are as man, what our purpose is. We have to be able to articulate it, ladies and gentlemen. All things done must be done in the Father's name. You see, we can't say, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow because we've just made a false promise, all right? Uh, and a false promise uh, for one that we can't live up to. And we're supposed to say, if the Father see it so, I'll see you tomorrow because tomorrow is never promised, ladies and gentlemen, all right? And that's why we do everything in the Father's name. I'm here by divine intervention in the name of the Father as a co-heir in Christ. I bring the land. Christ is the heir. When Jesus was sacrificed, Jesus inherited the heaven and the earth. Christ became grantee absolute. Thus, as brothers in Christ, ambassadors of peace, being born again about our Father's business, making us children of God and co-heirs through Christ. Equity says, whomever creates the problem must provide the remedy. Now, a lot of the preachers out there that hear me uh, teach this sermon today, I want you guys to understand I'm not a rabbi. I didn't go to some fancy school. I didn't go study Aramaic and Hebrew, and, and I wasn't over in Jerusalem, and I'm not touching stones and worshiping false idols and stuff. This stuff comes from my heart, and uh, I can't really explain to you why I could but most of you would never believe how it comes to me. So, <clears throat> with that said, this whole sermon is based upon the fact that equity says whomever creates the problem must provide the remedy. Now, pay attention because we're going to move pretty quick here. Thankfully, this will be recorded and you can re-listen to it over and over and over again. All right? God made us we man, knowing we are flawed, and in doing so had to provide remedy through Christ. We are made of the dirt of the earth on the outside and on and the breath of God on the inside. All right. The dirt of the earth on the outside and the breath, the spirit, the conscience of God on the inside. And he made us that way on purpose, naturally flawed. How so, one may ask. We are in a state of constant conflict of interest. Why? Because on the outside, we have the mud of Lucifer. And on the inside, we have the breath of God, good conscience, good reason, and the spirit of the Lord. And so we are a, a, a conflict of interest within ourselves, we are good and evil simultaneously. That's why the Heavenly Father sent Jesus down here. It wasn't to save you and I. 
but we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, I know a lot of churchgoers and Christians are going to be like, this guy has lost his ever-loving rocker. When I get done with this, you'll understand why Jesus Christ was sent here. <clears throat> we are made of the dirt of the earth on the outside and the breath of God on the inside. And he made us that way on purpose, naturally flawed. How so, one may ask. We are in a state of constant conflict of interest. Our flesh desires flesh, yet our spirit, the breath of God, the, the good conscience and reason, need not flesh. Thus a perpetual conflict arises. Let me help you uh, uh, visualize it. God created Adam. The name Adam in Hebrew translates to man. Adam and God had an amazing relationship. It was the spirit of God and Adam in the Garden of Eden, and everything was great. Nothing was flawed. It was perfect in every way. Then God said, it's not good that man's alone. So God put Adam to sleep and made a helpmate out of his side. And now there exists a choice, right? Because prior to Eve... There, there was no choice. It was just the spirit of the Heavenly Father and Adam in the garden. And when he chose to put Adam to sleep, and we'll get to that in a minute, it's very interesting how the Heavenly Father chose to take the body part he did and for what reason. And it may shock you. This is something you will never learn in a 501c3 church. I promise you that. So, for you gentlemen, was there really a serpent in the Garden of Eden, or was Eve the devil? That's for you men out there. It's a question for you. And ladies, not to leave you out. If Adam had not left Eve alone with the sexting serpent, would the serpent have been able to chat Eve up? and lure her into something? So that's a question for the ladies. And the question for the man is, was there really a serpent in the Garden of Eden? Or was Eve the devil? So why did God make us in the first place? This question, I want you to keep cycling through your mind as we go through this. Why did God make man? There has to be a reason. He does everything for a purpose. There's nothing that he hasn't done that didn't have great thought put into it. He knew me long before I was put on this earth, and he put me here for a reason. And I'm still, through my trials and tribulations, figuring out why I'm here. But there's good news. There's good news. For that, we have to look at Genesis 5. Why did God make us in the first place? The ten men's name in Genesis, from Adam to Noah, Adam equals man, Seth Okay, and I want you to comprehend what I'm saying. Now, keep in mind, I didn't go to school to learn how to read Aramaic or, or, or uh, Hebrew. Adam in Hebrew means man. Seth in Hebrew means appointed. Enosh in Hebrew means to die. Kaina equals sorrowful. Moha El, which was the first Hawaiian, equals God or equals from the presence of God. Jared translates in Hebrew, one comes down. Enoch equals dedicated. That's the translation in Hebrew. And when I get done reading this, it's going to floor you. Uh, uh, and I'm going to slaughter this name, forgive me. Uh, Melissa, Melusa uh, equals dying he shall sin. That's what uh, Melusha means in uh, um, Hebrew. Dying he shall sin. And then you have McMellan uh, equals to the poor and lowly. McMellan in Hebrew translates to the poor and lowly. And Lamech or Lemech equals rest and comfort. And then, of course, you have Noah. Now, I'm going to put this together so you understand exactly what those 10 men's names translate to in Genesis. All right. Man appointed to die, sorrowful, 
from the presence of God, one comes down dedicated, dying he shall sin to the poor and lowly, rest in comfort, Noah. <whistles> gives me chills, gives me goosebumps talking about that. So, through Adam's God, uh, godly line, God showing who he is and what he will do to these little jars of clay that are flawed. What jars of clay do I speak of? Us. We are the little malleable jars of clay with the breath of God on the inside and the mud of the earth on the outside. And as I go further into this gospel, you will understand what I'm talking about. The gospel of Cain is the gospel of the world. The gospel of Noah, however, is the gospel of Christ. Okay? So, who is God showing what he will do to these little jars of clay? Think about it for a moment. If your answer was Adam, keep in mind, Adam died before Noah. So Adam never saw rest and comfort, according to the five names in Genesis 5. See, because the, the, the full uh, uh, explanation had not yet been, man never gets to rest in comfort. Man never rests in comfort. We're not here on this earth to be comfortable it's a word that I really despise. Comfort, ladies and gentlemen, means that you are settling for what is there. It, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, that you're happy with it. It means that you've become comfortable. You're just going to settle for it because you can't find another way to push forward. But I'm telling you right now, there is a way through God, through Jesus Christ, through our Heavenly Father. There is a way to persevere. If your answer was Adam, keep in mind Adam died before Noah, so Adam never saw rest and comfort. So it was not Adam. Adam equals man in Hebrew, and man never sees rest and comfort. I find it amazing that God had Adam die before Noah was born, because otherwise Adam would have been looking out over his lineage of generations, all these messed up people doing messed up things for 300 or 939 years, messed up kids, debauchery, Nephilim, uh, false idols, false prophets, all across the planet. These are all Adam's kids, with the exception of Lemek's lineage. So, when God knew he was going to flood the earth, he had mercy on Adam, and Adam died. So Adam would not have to see his lineage wiped from the face of the earth with the flood. Talk about the grace of God. Could you imagine outliving your offspring? How much mourning you would go through day in and day out? How merciful is the Heavenly Father? That's wonderful, right? And people go, well, but, but he died. Yeah, he died, but he didn't have to see his entire lineage wiped from the face of the earth who smited the Heavenly Father, who participated in adultery and, and bolstering Babylon and false idols and debauchery across the world. God is good. And of course, Lemek died before Methuselah, and uh, Methuselah died before the flood came, and then Noah did his thing, right? Noah started to build the ark, Put all the animals on two by two, you know, making sure that the earth could be uh, rejuvenated with the uh, the essence of life that God, our heavenly creator, had, uh, had manifested into existence, right? The story gets deep. Stay with me. Who was on the earth before man came here? How many of you know that? If your answer is no one, you are incorrect. We must look at Isaiah 41. Lucifer, you were there in the beginning. Your hands are tambourines. Your lungs are pipe organs. Your garments are all uh, precious stones, rubies, sapphires. All beauty and wisdom was in you until inequity. Now, when I tell you that good book, ladies and gentlemen, has all the law in it. It's there. The sound doctrines and principles are within it if you know how to read between the lines and see the parody within the parables. Within the parables. So, Lucifer was the first being 
ever to exist. And his hands were tambourines and his vocal cords were pipe organs. He was the choir of heaven, okay? And you have to understand how this came to be because it explains exactly why you are here on this earth. God created the angels first, then cast out of heaven Lucifer and one third of his friends and threw them on the earth and the devil went to and fro, stomping out the earth. The earth became void and without form, without shape. All right. Taho Abaho, Abahu, which equals void and without shape. The earth was perfectly fine until Lucifer got kicked out of heaven. Then it became void and without form because he was so pissed off about being removed from heaven that he stomped across the earth, turning it into mud. All right? Just picture how pissed off Lucifer would have been being the first created being, wanting some of the glory for himself, for his part in the heavenly creation that our Father had created. Okay, just imagine this. He's been there from the beginning. He's singing. His hands are tambourines. Tells you that God, our heavenly creator, likes music in the background while he's creating. All right? Because the first being he created, created heavenly music. Okay? For his part, Lucifer wanted some glory. He wanted some people to recognize him. And God said, no, all the glory belongs to me. Lucifer was the choir singer of heaven. God likes music when he is creating. Then Lucifer said, I want a little something, something out of this for myself. I have put in... Uh, um, I want a little bit of something for myself because I put so much into this. And God said, no, I'm not going to share my glory with anybody. And he cast Lucifer out of heaven and down to earth. Now, remember, this goes back to why we are here. You're never going to hear this in a church. You're never going to hear this in a 501c3. I promise you that. So after Lucifer stomped out the earth, God sent, uh, God sent the spirit to recreate the earth, and God said to Lucifer, I will show you I am just in kicking you out of heaven. Because Paul says, Lucifer is the God of this world. And Jesus says, Lucifer is the prince of this world. All right? So Paul said it, that, that Lucifer is the God of this world, and then Jesus affirms it. And Jesus says, Lucifer is the prince of this world. God said, I'm going to take some of your mud, Lucifer, and I'm going to create man out of our image, your dirt on the outside, and the breath of God on the inside. And my dirt will worship me better than you do. I'm going to show to you that I am just and righteous and kicking you out of heaven and putting you on the earth. I'm going to show you your shit will worship you or worship me better than you. Could you imagine that defecating in the toilet? And God says, Derek, don't flush that yet. What's going on, God? Hey, I want you to look in the toilet. Okay. Your mud worships me better than you do. Ooh. Wow. Powerful, right? Your turd in the toilet worships me better than you do. That's what he's saying to Lucifer. Okay. And I'm going to create man out of uh, our image, your dirt on the outside and the breath of God on the inside. And my dirt will, will, will worship me. Your dirt will worship me better than you do. So God created Adam and God instructed Adam to name the animals. So Adam said, okay, okay, we're jumping ahead here. You know, he's making Adam, he's fashioning him out of the, the, the mud of the earth and the spirit, the breath of God on the inside. So Adam takes on the task to be about his father's business, right? And he starts naming Mr. and Mrs. Draft, Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan, Mr. and Mrs. Hippo. But God knew eventually Adam would come to realize 
that he was missing his missus. There's Mr. and Mrs. Draft, there's Mr. and Mrs. Hippo, there's Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan, and God knew that Adam would eventually comb the entire earth looking for his missus. God eventually, uh, Adam would come to the uh, to looking for his missus, and God said, it's not good that man's alone. Every other animal has its like kind, male and female, so God put Adam to sleep and fashioned Eve from his rib. And this is where it gets good. He didn't fashion Eve from the cranium because Eve was not to be above Adam. And he didn't fashion Eve from the sole of the foot because Adam was not to walk over Eve. He fashioned Eve from the rib, from the side, because they were partners, they were helpmates. They were to do the works of the Father. They were to be about the works of the Father, ladies and gentlemen. And he did not want Adam alone. He saw it that it is not good for man to be alone, even though Adam never felt alone. Adam always had the Spirit in the Garden of Eden with him. Adam was never alone. But now Adam has a mate, a helpmate. All right? Because she was not above him and not from his feet... Uh, uh, so she was not below him, but from his side, for they were to be beside one another as partners and helpmates. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, Adam was overjoyed. And thus Adam uh, knew Eve. In the very next part, Adam had went out to do the work of his father and left Eve alone. All of a sudden, Eve finds herself under the one tree she is not to be around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right. Now follow me on this. So Eve, a little disgruntled, thinking bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Where is he? Where is that Adam? You know, I'm his, I'm his helpmate. He's left me. He's probably hanging out with the orangutans, his friends that he made before I was here. You know, she's feeling a little disgruntled. She's being left out, right? And that goes back to the question, was Eve the devil, man? And then I go to the women and I say, or would that sexy serpent had an opportunity to even chat up Eve had Adam not left her alone? You see that, that perpetual conflict? But we're going to get to the answer. So Eve, a little disgruntled, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, where is he? He, uh, he's probably hanging out with his, his orangutan friends and his unicorns and, 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 and the things he knew before me. Where is he at? We are supposed to be together. So she's upset. Then the sexy serpent shows up and asks Eve, what about this tree over here? And Eve says, Adam says we are not to eat from it or touch it. But wait a minute. Adam never told Eve that she wasn't supposed to touch it. Eve is now creating her own rules, okay? And when you break down the word touch in Hebrew, it means to lust. So Eve is lusting over this tree. It's lusting. She's lusting. Remember, these are all in parables. Adam says we are not to eat from it or touch it. So Eve adding to it, the word touch in Hebrew translates to lust, but Eve added a rule. Adam only said we are not to eat from it, but Eve created her own rule, and when you translate the word touch, it means to lust in Hebrew. She was lusting over the tree, over the knowledge of good and evil, over the ability to make a decision for herself about right versus wrong. So the sexy serpent says, why not? And Eve said, because we shall surely die. The serpent said, surely you won't die. Your eyes will be open and you will become like God. So she ate from the tree. When Adam had come back, Eve said, try this fruit. It's really wonderful. She, Eve, decided what was good for her and fornicated with the devil ladies and gentlemen, and in doing so, decided the difference between right and wrong for herself. You see, we're never supposed to touch 
the forbidden fruit on that tree. By the way, Eve was never called Eve in the garden. She was known as woman, which means and translates to woman means for the man. Now remember, Eve fornicated with Lucifer in the garden. And now she's coming back with her little peach going, hey, try some of this fruit. It's really good. Adam thought everything was created for him. Adam may have thought he was the center of the universe. It was all created for him. So the woman said, eat from it. It is good. And so Adam thought, my beautiful woman has defiled herself with the sexy serpent. But the Lord has given all this to me. So Adam had a choice. He knew that she would surely die. Because remember, the atonement for not taking heed in the instruction of not taking from the, the, the tree of knowledge was that you would surely die. And he did not want to be alone again. Adam, knowing full well God had in fact given him everything, could not bear the idea of being alone and fornicated with Eve. So Adam made a choice of door number two, which got him kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Sweat of the brow is the undertaking of not listening to the Heavenly Father. For where once everything was abundant and fruitful, now he's going to have to plow the ground and work for it. And the pain of labor is what the woman now incurs. Okay? Before that, there was no pain of labor and there was no sweat of the brow because everything was abundant. It was all there until they chose, till Eve made a decision to decide for herself right from wrong. You see, we're supposed to pray to the Heavenly Father. We're supposed to give him our burdens and let him come back to us with the answers, with the path, with the trajectory we should be on. Stay with me. I know this is a little lengthy. So Eve sleeps with the serpent. She sleeps with Lucifer. Adam sleeps with, with uh, Eve. They get kicked out of the garden. The Heavenly Father sends a bird down with uh, the skin of an animal that has not been tanned yet. It's all bloody. And puts it on them and kicks them out of the garden of Eden. Uh, Eden. And uh, the the pain of childbirth comes from that. The, the, the sweat of the brow, the having to work all the time. The toil of the earth is now theirs. Thank you for playing the paradise game. So Adam chose woman over God. He made a choice. He made a decision when he should have given it to God. He should have left it to the Father. And instead... Uh, because he didn't want to be alone, he forsaken the word of the Heavenly Father and he partook and they got kicked out. You can never... Uh, um, you can never put a woman, a child, a government above the Heavenly Father. You just can't do it. So the question becomes... Why did God make man? This is so important. For you fighting in court, for you guys that, that uh, need some help in the court, this, this sermon today is going to help you out, believe it or not. And I want you to listen to it over and over and over again, because by the time I'm done, you will understand why you're here. Remember the angels were looking in on this and watching both the fallen angels and the righteous angels were observing God's grace and mercy being blessed upon man. Now, why were the angels so astonished by all this? You see, because God does not provide redemption. Our Heavenly Father does not provide redemption for the angels. There is no redemption. They listen, they do what they're told, or they are cast out. There is no redemption. There is no forgiveness for the angels. Isn't that something? And as they're watching and observing the Heavenly Father administer the grace and the mercy being blessed upon mankind and in awe of his decision. Why? Because the angels, for the angels, there's never redemption.
However, man does have redemption by the grace and mercy of our Heavenly Father. So the angels are looking down on this redemption, mercy, and grace, and they are amazed that man is going to rule over the angels. And Lucifer says, why would you have this talking monkey, this rule over me, this, this dirty man who's a constant contradiction, an accuser, rule over me? Look at that of which you have created. Look at the evil crap that man does. And they're going to lord over us in heaven. And the heavenly father said. God told Lucifer. Yes. I see it. But. He believes in me. He worships me. And that's why he'll rule over you in heaven. <whistles> Powerful. Thus God said, I made man with your mud on the earth, on the outside, and my breath on the inside, and even your mud, Lucifer, worships me better than you do. In comparison, it's like God asking you to look in the toilet and telling you that your fecal matter worships him better than you do. It causes Lucifer to go into a blind rage. That's, that's how big of an uh, uh, indictment we are to the devil, to Lucifer. When we speak about our Father, our Creator, when we praise Him, the shit of the earth, Lucifer's mud, worships Him better than Lucifer does. So what? Uh, so when it comes down to having a choice, Paul said, "The things I don't, I I don't uh, want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do." Who will free me from this body of death? So my flesh wants to do what the devil says. And my spirit of the breath of God, the heavenly uh, father's conscience, wants to do what God says that we should. Uh, thus, we are born with a conflict of interest. So. If I do what the devil says and I give into my flesh, the devil rejoices and the angels weep and God still loves me the same. And if I rebuke the flesh and I do what God says, the angels rejoice, the devil hisses and the demons flee and God still loves me the same. So now we've got to take God out of the equation. We've got to take the Father out of the equation. Why? Because he loves us the same. Either way we go, he loves us the same. And this important thing about this sermon is to show you why we are here. To show you why Jesus Christ was put on this earth. So we remove God from the equation. Since he loves us either way, equally. So it comes down to a choice. Do I, we, us, and our choose to piss off the devil or make the angels weep? The choice is yours. So why did God make us? To prove the devil wrong. To show the devil that he was righteous and just and casting him out of heaven. That God was righteous kicking him out of heaven we are here to prove the devil wrong, that God is righteous, true, correct, in kicking him out of heaven. Who is the clay to tell the potter not to mar me? The potter says, I will mar you if I see it fit. So Jesus did not die for our sins. Equity demands whoever creates the problem must create the remedy. Because... God created us flawed. He sent down Jesus Christ to provide remedy through his sinless life. The will of the Father was not to be defamed because the day you sin, you shall surely die. So Christ came down with a sinless life and he was crucified, giving us a way to heaven. But it had nothing to do with us, ladies and gentlemen. Christ dying had nothing to do with us. Why? Because he was doing the works of his father. It didn't have anything to do with us. 
because equity sees that if you create a problem, you must provide the remedy. This is law. It's been established from the beginning of time. It's well known. He was crucified giving us a way through he to heaven. And the only way to heaven is through Christ. We're going to get in a little deeper into this. We're, we're busting into trust law, grant or grantee relationship, grant or settler, okay? Co-heirs, beneficiaries. Stay with me. <clears throat> As he, Jesus, was doing the work of his father, because he must be about his father's business, what can be deduced from all of this? The tree of knowledge is deciding in your life what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil for yourself. But we're not supposed to be doing that. When we should be praying to be shown what is true and uh, turning it over to God, which leads me to my next point. I must be about my father's business. Ladies and gentlemen, we must always be about our father's business. So that conducts the sermon. So the question is, do you know why you were put here? You were put here to prove the devil wrong. Your flesh naturally desires flesh. That's the work of the devil. But the inside of you, the spirit of the Lord, good conscience, grace, it's all within you, was breathed into your nostrils. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come down here to die for our sins. He came down here to correct the record, period. Because he who creates a problem has, a, has the burden of providing the remedy. And the remedy was through Christ, a man who was completely sinless. And Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice, inherited the heaven and the earth as grantee absolute from the grantor, his heavenly father. That's what he received in return. And that's what makes us being reborn again. Because remember, uh, uh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus was holier than thou, but he wasn't the son of God. And Nicodemus asked Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus said, you must be born again. To be a child of God, you must be born again. So even Nicodemus, as holy as he was, as, as pure and as virtuous as he was, still wasn't the son of God yet because he hadn't been reborn. The power of the name decree. I'm not saying that you have to go into a church to be baptized, ladies and gentlemen. My mamma lived a hundred and some years old, was baptized in the Kentucky River, hair six foot long, flowing down the river. The, 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 the temple is not the four walls that you've been led to believe. The temples are here. You don't have to be baptized by somebody who says they're holier than thou. Because chances are... <clears throat> well, it's like this. Let me put it this way. It's like marriage. You don't get married before the eyes of the state. You get married before the eyes of the Lord. And when you split them sheets, ladies and gentlemen... I got news for you. You married. You married. You bet your ass you are. All these people thinking you need a piece of paper to tell you you're married. It's absolutely malarkey. Absolute malarkey. So, when Jesus became grantee absolute and you became saved and now you're a son of God, an ambassador of peace, a brother in Christ, you are a co-heir and beneficiary to the estate. What estate? The heaven and the earth. So you have to make a decision. Do you give into your flesh and, the, and Lucifer rejoices and the angels weep? Or do you follow the spirit within you, the breath of life, and the angels rejoice? Lucifer hisses and the demons run. The choice is yours. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day, give us this day our daily bread, and help us to forgive those who trespass against us, as we forgive them their trespass. I just gave you the key to your courtroom problem. <laughs>